Howdy. How's it going? Sam Plot here. <coughs> Just wanted to um, make a few videos to try to line up my uh, poetry over the years. And I thought I would start with this in uh, 2007. I think I'm going to start with 2007. I might, I might do some others that um, do the, the early years. Um, but um, I have good archives put together beginning in 2007. Um, most likely because I came into a, a laptop that was given to me very kindly by a good friend. Um, so um, that was a good thing. From 2004 to 2008, I lived in an apartment at 35 Cornwall Street um, in San Francisco. I absolutely loved it. It was good times. I was working at a luggage store during those times. And um, I was uh, feeling feeling um, safe and happy. I had found a, a nice place to live. I was, was pretty happy with that. And um, 2007, 2008, I think I had, I had some good flow going, had some nice writing going. As I read through these, it, uh, it dawned on me that I had two that are the uh, similar kind of idea, the composite sketch of sort of a person, um, a person made out of many different ideas, um, some of them about other people. But So um, if you recognize yourself in there, it's not you. It's um, a bunch of people have said that to me over the years. Were you, was that about me? Well, no, it wasn't. You're just... Uh, crazy dude. Anyway, um, filming here in my studio, which is, uh, which is, uh, named after this painting here called My Process is Loud, and, um, that's the name of the studio. In 2007, let's see, 2007, I'm, I'm wearing this baseball hat in honor of 2007 without mentioning it any further. Um, those who know, know. And um, here's the first composite sketch um, that I was referring to. This is called Ants in the Belfry. And you know, right off the bat, you're in trouble. Anyway, Ants in the Belfry. You know that guy, he's got ants in the belfry. He's a lunatic space cadet. He's a couple bricks shy of a full wall. You know that guy, he's always smoking kefir. He listens to Jujuka. He's not the sharpest bulb in the drawer. He's got ants in the belfry. He's playing the game and he's missing a one-eyed jack and a queen of hearts. His deck is stacked with jokers. You know that guy. He's always smoking volcanoes and he listens to Sid Barrett and Talking Heads. But his elevator doesn't work right. It goes sideways. It goes diagonally. It goes everywhere all at once. Except to the top. It doesn't go to the top. October 13th, 2007, Ants in the Belfry. That was a, always a fun one. I liked, I liked reading that. It had a little bit of humor in it. thought I could have a good time with it, and it was fun to read with music um, back then. Doesn't make it into the repertoire so, so often now. Um, this is a, a 2007 piece that does. Um, it's called, Do You Think Your Health Cares? There's a lot of talk about health care at the time. I was definitely had that um, on my mind. I had some health issues, and I was not very well able to deal with them with the, the medical plan that I had at the time. So health care was important to me at the time, and it was um, something I was struggling with and having some trouble. So it was... Um, it was um, Definitely in the top of my mind. I had that as a subject anyway, uh, and this um, veered in, in sort of a different a different way. I wasn't necessarily uh, addressing healthcare specifically as much as just, um, I don't know, a 
better way for the common man, I think, really. But you're not supposed to explain your poems. You're supposed to just get at it. And this is called Do, your, Do You Think Your Health Cares? Do you think your health cares about reincarnation as much as your body worries about decomposing into a symphony of properly appropriate karma? But is there really any way to know if you're where you want to be? Is there really some form of teletransport to take us straight to the place we have envisioned? In fantasy, in sleeping bag dreams, or the much maligned daydream, during which no hunger stops progress because there is no hunger. Daydreams during which no meanness is perpetrated, not by the strong against the weak, not by the weak upon the weaker, because there is no meanness, no poverty, no money, no debts, no ownership of anybody or anything. Everyone is without money, nobody is rich, nobody lends or borrows. Because if the teletransport is ready, I'm ready to take it. To my final destination, to the next way station, to some kind of creation, some lost civilization. January 23rd, 2007. Do you think your health cares? I'm reading them, um, you know, the series goes chronologically, starting in 2007, and, um, and probably the prequel will come after that, um, but uh, they're chronological, and then within the chronological, they're alphabetical, unless I decide otherwise, um, for the sort of the set list quality, um, so mostly they're pretty alphabetical here. Um, so we just did A and D, and now we're going to go to the key of L for um, Lost Cat Found, a composite sketch. Once again, without explaining, um, here's the explanation. I was sitting, waiting, um, after having ordered um, dinner at this pasta place with my buddy Rory, and um, my phone rang, and I said, excuse me, I'm going to go take a call, and I stepped outside the restaurant to take the call, answered it on the way out, and said, hold on, and I'm coming. Got out there, and as I looked up, I saw a sign on the, uh, I mean, this person had found a cat, but they made a sign that just said, lost cat found, that's, that's all the sign said, it didn't, it was, it was made by a child, and and you know, with all, all good intention, and maybe there was a phone number down the bottom, but I never got that far because I was laughing too hard that, that the cat was found and there was no way to uh, necessarily track it down. Uh, it was on a Muni shelter, the Muni bus shelter, in the middle of uh, San Francisco over in Laurel Heights. And, um, and I put this down at Rory's house, most of it, I think I got it straight um, at Rory's house once I got back there. I grabbed a paper and pen and put this down, looking around at some of the things around his house and extrapolated on that. It was a, this isn't the guy that Rory was at all, um, but uh, definitely just saw a couple of things, the cherry tomatoes on his, on his uh, counter at the time where I read it in the kitchen. But... Um, my buddy Johnny was on the other end of the phone, and I told him about the sign. I said, hey, man, you should go write this this poem. He's a great poet. I said, you should go write this. And he was kind of like, uh, yeah, you know, the same as me. Like, whenever people say that to you, you're kind of like, that's not my inspiration. It sounds like you're inspired by it. You should go do that. Um, so he kind of chuckled at me saying that to him because we've talked about that over the years. And then I went uh, and wrote the poem, and it goes like this. This is the other composite sketch, by the way, that I have to recognize um, is, is a very similar pattern to, to a poem as the first one. He was a real gone cat, man. He always 
siphoned his gas, and he only drove at night. But his style was all his own. He grew cherry tomatoes and blue glass 23.6. His favorite food was Belgian endive. He walked sideways through doorways. He actually liked and often played Pong. He insisted on making all his own juices. He wore only hemp, hemp socks, hemp boxers, rope necklaces, and hemp hats. He almost always was willing to run interference, and he had a special knack for causing socially awkward situations. He always made phone calls. He never accepted them. And sometimes he would walk all over Laurel Heights, top to bottom, hop a taxi to SFO and then fly to John Wayne, rent a car, and abandon it in Laurel Canyon. Walking. And simply leaving behind all his ginger root and Italian parsley, all his Ginsburg and his Brodigan, all his long boards and his hemp hoodies and his frisbees. All of his CDRs and that iPod that he never bought. And he would walk clear back to Laurel Heights and nobody knew where he'd been, least of all him. I tell you though, he was a great guy, just a little different than most. Once he got religion, he was a lost cat. Okay, one of the times I looked up while I'm making this, I realized that I was supposed to shut these lights off back here for less light. Was that a little bit better? Okay, there we go, better light. Lost cat found. Um, okay. Back to San Francisco. I used to head a lot of times after work. I would get a chance to, um, to go out to um, either Hippie Hill or I would go out to the beach. I could, I could hop right on the Muni downtown and ride a train out to the beach pretty quick or get out to Haight Street even even faster and um, go throw, either throw a little blanket down, I would bring everything with me, have a book to read, have a notebook, um, lots of music to listen to, and um, anything else I might need, uh, buy a coffee, go hang out and write and listen to the drums and whatever all else was going on a nice sunny day, it was a beautiful way to spend uh, my, my after work hours um, or, or my days off. And I would be in Golden Gate Park a lot. And um, I was by the Conservatory of Flowers this one time and I um, had to move because there were some folks that were kind of messing up my concentration. And, um, and I had to move and get to a different place. And um, I went and found a bench which I didn't usually do, but I was lucky enough to have found a bench on the little back alleys behind the flower, Conservatory of Flowers. And I um, sat down, started writing. I was wearing this sort of bright colored shirt, almost like this orange color back here on this painting, actually a really, really bright shirt that I liked wearing at the time. And I think um, this hummingbird thought I was actually a flower. So... I guess I just gave away the story, but that's pretty much what happened. It was pretty cool. It's called Two Seconds, because that's about how long it took. April 12, 2007. This is a true story. I lost my echo location. I lost my echo location. I lost my echolocation, my only indication of my ever-changing situation. I lost my concentration dropped in puddle mud. 
And then I looked up face to bird face to see a hummingbird eye level stutter stepping. Must have thought I was a bright flower as I sat stationary, orange shirt writing in the sun. I looked up directly into her or his. Helicopter floating spastic freeze frame face. Helicopter floating spastic freeze frame face. Animated as I moved, she or he hesitated in place like a boxer in training, stutter stepping, darting, dancing, humming, scat singing. Dancing this hesitating levitation of flying herky motion, it must have lasted two long seconds as we both surprised each other. Yeah, and that was it. As a, it was literally what I had written to the to that moment. And I, I was writing about my loss of my concentration and dropped. And I looked down. And there was a puddle of mud. I wrote, dropped in a puddle of mud. I mean, puddle sounded funny at that point. So I put dropped in puddle mud, and then I looked up and told the rest of the story from there. It was kind of weird. I was writing about echolocation and a hummingbird decided to show up. It's probably about as close as you can get to a, to a bat, maybe, I guess, in the bird world. But anyway, it's not an overwhelming amount of chatter in here, so it's nice to read poetry, but there's also no feedback after you do anything, so that's always interesting making a video. Then again, much like it was to the hummingbird, this poem is called What It Seems. Who can't relate to the age-old idea that nothing's what it seems, it seems, it seems. With this spirit's essence distilled, broken down by self, taken apart, but not yet put back together. Sunken under gracefully pools reflective stanzas condensed to repeating, 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 repeating mantras concerning lost tribes remaining faithful to their mission. Contradicting only the wrongs of injustice and the perpetrators of such. Infallible as humans can be, lost in confidence, success, denial. Soaking up sponges, you won't get the good without the bad. And fast to congratulate, but what were we celebrating? Confusion and ambiguity are all I can confess to sharing. Nothing's ever what it seems, it seems. Nothing like you dreamed or remembered. All right. And then winding it down with one more that um, also gets an explanation. Uh, my buddy Dano had nicknamed me over the years, um, given my, my potential to jabber and go on and be a madman and uh, oftentimes, um, I don't know, be rather obsessive about that, uh, excited, excitable, um, all of the above maybe sometimes all at once under uh, the influence of, uh, at the time, alcohol and or um, whatever all else. I'd just be a little hyper and excited. And uh, he, uh, he spun me around one afternoon, you know, on my back and said, yeah, well, just like I thought, there's no off button. He was looking for a way to shut me off. And that wise ass comment didn't do it either. Uh, well, I got caught no off button for a little while until I made it into this poem and turned turned it into a positive, I guess. It was, I don't know. No off button by Sam Flott. Let's see if we got a date on this. There's no, no specific date on this, 2007. I didn't know I had to be on all the time, ready with regurgitated words at the get-go, at the ready, at the tip of the point of the top of my very own tongue. 
Brain shaving spit forth in a maelstrom of mental activity, swirling in manic fury of multitasking beauty. Matching rhythms to beats, rhythms to beats, rhythms to beats. And managing to put it just before or on or just after. Just before or on or just after your brain starts firing images, salacious verbiage connected to the disconnected and the interconnected. Followed by succinct labor of minarets built on the audacity of worshippers with flaming candles singing tantric mantras, wearing sandals and making swirling mandalas which envelop minds and develop the contents into tables of intention which become real when mixed with action. And whether or not the wind blows or the sun shines, whether or not the climate is conducive to your activity, the show must go on. And on 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 and never end. I didn't know I had to be on all the time spewing surreal logic and loquacious hip lingo in non-jingoistic linguistics for undefined periods of time. Limited only by self-constriction to keep going or yes or you can stop and um, those being the options uh, that poem ends with to keep going or because it's it's no off button and um, what I eventually developed reading that on stage with music was that it was fun to just keep saying to keep going or to keep going or and do that many times while the jam played out and it was always a lot of fun. Uh, the genesis of that poem, the other, the beyond the um, the title of it, is where where the beginning of all that comes from. Is uh, I didn't know I had to be on all the time. Um, was that um, at somebody um, somebody who met well uh, leaned over to me in the Connecticut Yankee one night. On my, on my um, path to the stage, my name had been called uh, to come up and read, I don't remember with who, but somebody had called me up to come and do a sit-in and read a poem, and I was stepping up there, walking up with my paper, and the person kind of reached out and sort of put a hand on the page and said, you know, hey, just make it up off the top of your head, man, just go right off the top of your head and go. And um, I went up there and read the poem I had specifically chosen for the time and place and was trying to fit in with them, either the music I knew was coming or what I thought it was going to be like, And because uh, making it up off the top of your head really tends for me to end up being pretty silly and comedic, and if we're lucky it's funny, otherwise it's just goofy, and um, I spend a lot of time on getting the poem right or writing it in the in the moment that it is right and getting it right later, editing, get it down, something that's readable and uh, workable for everybody. So this was my reply to him later when I had a chance to sit down and answer back to a person that said that to me while I had a lot on my mind about going up to read a poem with somebody. And I, uh, I was just kind of like, geez, man, I, don't know. I didn't know how to be on all the time. Like, I just have to be able to flip this poetic switch and I'm, you know, amazing. So it's a hard enough, uh, a hard enough world for a poet jumping up with music and in it to try to do these things with um, people that do like what you're doing, never mind, you know, fighting against the people that never seen anything like that or they think you shouldn't be reading off a page or whatever all else, you know. But um, anyway, that was my reaction in the moment. Um, I got down to write it down later and just say, like, wow, I'm not, that's not how it works for me. So that's no off button. It's got a, a lot of genealogy, a lot of, uh, a lot of different uh, things that I guess can explain it. Um, so anyway, 2007, coming to a close. We're all finished here. I did not have this um, lovely art studio to paint in in 2007. I didn't paint in 2007. I just hung out and wrote all the time um, in my tiny little apartment um, on Cornwall Street. Loved that place. It was a great location. And um, loved my time in San Francisco. Now I live in Washington State and I couldn't be happier. So 2007 to 2000, from 2020, 
2007, Sam Flott 